started. Uh, for those of you who didn't hear, I am Parker Flickinger. I am the uh, community engagement uh, and uh, marketing coordinator for Lahontan Audubon Society. Uh, I am joined with uh, Ben Sonnenberg, uh, who you may have seen on several of our previous walks or on lectures about his chickadee research through UNR. Uh, he will be assisting me today with uh, our lecture. Uh, our webinar is all about eBird. Uh, both Ben and I are routine eBird users. And uh, I have decided today to show a lecture all about eBird and how uh, tips on how to use eBird either uh, to, um, to log species and help build your life list. Uh, um, before I get started, I also wanted to mention uh, during this uh, webinar, if you have any questions, uh, we will have a Q&A session uh, after my presentation is done. Uh, if you just go click uh, on the screen, uh, there's the Q&A button uh, and type in your Q&A question. Uh, ben will read them to me uh, in our post uh, in our Q&A session later on. Uh, if you are watching on Facebook, uh, we're live streaming this to Facebook, uh, you can just uh, type in your Q&A uh, on the Facebook comments. Uh, and once again, uh, Ben will read them and uh, ask them uh, later on during my session. So without further ado, let's get started. So the title of my presentation, I call it Getting Lift to Your Lift, Your List, an Introduction to the eBird Platform. So as I said before, uh, my name is Parker Flickinger. Uh, I work as the Community Engagement and Marketing Coordinator for Lahontan Audubon Society for the program through the program of uh, Volunteers in Service to AmeriCorps, uh, to America and AmeriCorps. So first off, uh, I want to answer the obvious question, what is eBird? eBird is a bird uh, observation and sharing site put on by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology in New York. It is digital and runs similar to a uh, sharing site such as Flickr, it, uh, how Flickr shares photographs. Uh, only this one is all about sharing uh, observations through birding checklists and some bird photography if there are photographers. Uh, this photo was taken on a walk where we kept an eBird list. Um, what are the benefits of e using eBird? Well, one, you can participate in this global community science project. Uh, there are eBird users all over the world. Uh, from India to Japan, to England, uh, to Australia, everywhere you can find bird observations from all different species, such as these uh, great blue herons to endangered species, such as emperor penguins and California condors. Um, eBird is also great. Uh, one of the perks is uh, for life listing. I don't know if any of you have seen this funny comedy movie, The Big Year, which is about competitive bird watchers. But one of the perks eBird does is it keeps track of all the species you have seen during your lifetime uh, and gives you a goal to shoot for of building your life list. And another great thing is eBird. Uh, eBird is probably at parks that are in your local community. Uh, eBird, this park in this picture right here is Oxbow Nature Study Area, where uh, there is uh, active eBird users have post list, uh, have post bird, posted bird checklists. So it's eBird is great for using uh, if you want to learn about the birds in your community. Uh, it also takes uh, data and uh, statistics of like which birds are common, what types of year, uh, which, what is the average, the mean, which bird is the medium, which bird is the mode, and so forth. And another great uh, perk that eBird uses is birding hotspots beyond your home. Uh, I don't know if anybody recognizes this map right here, but this is a map of downtown Boston uh, as seen on the eBird website. Uh, here in downtown Boston, uh, 
I was taking a holiday to Boston and I used Eber to find uh, the park, uh, Olmsted Park, which is highlighted. And during my holiday, I was able to go out bird watching and have a great time. And I took these two photos, this one of this uh, great blue heron at the lake and this one of these foraging Canada geese. The final big thing I wanna talk about is eBird events, uh, including this one, which is October Big Day. October Big Day is, based, is an unofficial holiday all about bird watching, where birders from around the world all go out bird watching on October 9th. Uh, it, Big Day is a biannual event that happens during the migration seasons in uh, um, October and May for autumn and uh, for the autumn migration and the spring migrations respectively. Uh, um, some people go out and try to hit as many uh, birding hotspots as they can in 24 hours. Uh, other people just enjoy the simple pleasure of going birding in our local park. We will be celebrating a uh, big day uh, by hosting webinars such as this one and by hosting bird walks, uh, which will be happening on October 9th. I will be hosting one at Oxbow and Ben will be hosting one at Galena Creek, which you still have, they still have spaces and you can register for on our website. Uh, we also have an eBird account for La Haunt and Audubon Society, which I created specifically for this purpose about teaching bird watching to our community and also highlighting some of the birds that we can see in our community and finally participating in events such as October Big Day. This is the uh, um, photo of our eBird page, uh, as you would see. Uh, um, unfortunately, uh, you can only access our account and share information if you join eBird, uh, which I will be discussing that later on in the presentation. So there are different formats for the website eBird. Uh, one of the format for those of you who are really tech savvy is eBird has an app uh, which can be used on any type of smartphone, Android, Apple, it all works with eBird. Uh, it uh, uses your phone's GPS so it keeps track of, uh, and it uses your phone's uh, clock app so it keeps track of the time uh, automatically uh, the only thing you have, and it also keeps track of the distance you cover. The only thing you have to keep track of is the birds. Uh, however, if you are like me though, I'm kind of old fashioned and I uh, prefer old school bird listing where I'm out there with my binoculars uh, and a notepad and uh, a pen and I'm writing the birds. And then I go back to my computer, which uh, I then input the data manually. I prefer this because it encourages me to do quality assurance and quality control with the species I see. All righty. I, I was just going to add one thing, Parker, before you go on. All these apps from eBird, so signing up for eBird, and then this mobile app that uh, Parker just described, all of these are free. So just completely open uh, to download for no cost to you, and you can enroll. Um, uh, and you know, contribute to the community science that eBird allows you to do. So that's that's one great part and that I get asked frequently is whether or not it costs money and it does not. Yes, it completely is completely free. And that's a great, uh, that leads into the point that I mentioned about participating in the global birding community, which is why I like eBird so much. So now I'm going to get to, let's get some starting ingredients if you want to join up with eBird and use it for your life listing. The first thing is your senses and observations. You definitely want to go out and either use your eyes and your ears uh, when you're out and about to look for birding, uh, to look for the birds that you see out birding. Uh, we had a great lecture by Jenny Sherbinsky all about uh, how to find birds uh, and how to help identify birds. Uh, um, that, web, uh, that webinar is posted on our Facebook page and will be posted on our YouTube channel later on for you all to enjoy. Um, the next thing you need uh, in order to use eBird is, as I said before, you need some sort of computerized device and an email service. Uh, 
That is how you register for eBird. Uh, like I said, you can use uh, smartphones, tablets, uh, computers, uh, laptop or desktop computers, Mac or PC, and you can use any sort of email, be it Gmail, Outlook, MSN.com. It's just a simple task of going to their website, eBird.org, clicking sign up and then creating, you know, uh, using an email address as your key and creating a username and password. And the final thing, as I've mentioned before, is recommending is getting a pair of binoculars. Binoculars are the birder's best friend and they will make a world of difference. Um, I definitely recommend getting a larger pair of binoculars with the larger uh, objective lenses. I've shown this, I took this picture here and there's a dollar bill for size comparison. The larger the objective lenses are, the more light and the brighter the pictures that you're seeing in your binoculars are. So that's what I recommend. And now I'm gonna go over the uh, key uh, items you need in order to make your bird list. There are three things that go into creating your bird list. The first one is uh, the birds you see. Uh, you want to record all the different species, bird species you need on your bird walk, uh, as well as the number of each species you see on that walk. So if you see, say, uh, um, three crows and a goose on your walk, you'd record that as a crow, and then you put a number three uh, for each crow, and then you would put one goose. So the next thing is the duration. Uh, that is the time you started on officially on your bird walk and started looking for the birds, uh, that start time and how long you've gone, say uh, one hour and uh, 10 minutes and so on and so forth. And the final thing is you wanna record is distance um, with an estimate how much distance you covered on your birding trip. Uh, this is often an estimate for someone like me because I'm walking. Uh, that's a perk for the eBird app is that it uses your GPS app and the pedometer in your phone to automatically record that. But it's still a good idea to go out, uh, in my opinion, to uh, look and estimate what distances you're uh, going out and walking at. So there are three types of eBird observations. There is traveling where you are taking a walk specifically for bird watching. Traveling can be done by yourself. It does not just have to be a walk hosted by say us at Lahant and Audubon Society or Ben through UNR or Great Basin Bird Observatory or any other group. It can be just you going out on your family outing. That counts as a traveling eBird observation. Stationary is where you're observing birds from a fixed location, such as using, uh, going to, using a bird blind at a wildlife refuge, or simply uh, sitting on your couch and watching the birds in your backyard uh, at your feeders. And finally, there is incidental. Incidental is where you incidentally find a bird while you are out shopping, uh, driving, working in your garden, or some uh, other task. Uh, this is a photo I took at one of the Walmarts where there was a great horned owl roosting. Uh, that is an incidental, that is the perfect incidental observation. So now I'm getting back to the ingredients. Again, this is old school ingredients uh, for old school birding like what I do. But the first one is uh, a notepad and pencils. Pencils, like I said, are your best friend. Uh, and the notepad, that's where you keep track of all your data, including time, uh, distance, uh, location, and the number and types of each bird species observed. The next thing you want is a timepiece. Uh, these can be either a smartphone or a watch. Uh, I prefer using a watch because it's waterproof and sometimes I'm going out into the field, uh, say at a lake where I definitely don't wanna drop my phone in the water and get it lost. Uh, that's a terrible thing. But again, uh, a watch is just optional and a matter of taste. 
Um, an extra thing recommended is a birding book. Uh, I definitely recommend if you are serious about birding, uh, picking up a birding book. Uh, um, you can get birding books at the library. You can get them uh, online uh, and they're not that expensive. Uh, there are many available. Uh, um, any bird guide you get that's within say maybe uh, 10 or uh, 15 years will still be good. Uh, some of the older ones that are over 20 years, uh, the species may have changed. Some of them have may have moved away. But generally, any bird brand, uh, there's all bird brands are good. My personal pick are the Sibley guides, but that's just my own personal pick. Okay, so now uh, as a treat, what I am going to do now is show you using our uh, eBird page, uh, I'm going to show you what it's like to uh, input a birding list that on a list that I have taken. So I will go here. Uh, I have already logged into our uh, Lahontan Audubon Society birding account. Uh, you can see that's our name right here. So I took this special list right now. Uh, you probably can't read it on the little screen, but it was at Rancho San Rafael Park. Uh, I took it yesterday uh, and uh, I observed some species. So. I've got it here. These are all the locations we've uh, recorded from uh, our adventures, be they say personal lists that people have submitted to our uh, eBird account or uh, eBird walks we have led uh, and the like. So I'm going to scroll down here. Here is Rancho San Rafael Park in Reno. And uh, I was traveling on this walk, so I'm going to select traveling and I'm going to select the date, which was yesterday, October 6th. And then I'm going to put the start time in. Uh, I'm using a uh, military time right now. Uh, again, uh, you can use a 12 hour clock, but I prefer to use military time. Uh, I started at 341, so that it is 341. And then I was birding for, I need to do the math. Uh, 20 minutes. So I put in 20 minutes and then I put the rough estimate for my distance, which I will put in uh, a quarter mile is about what I hiked. And then it was just me. So uh, I put in party size as one. Then you click continue. And now I put in my species. So uh, you can't, you might be able to see this, uh, but uh, I saw species like I saw mallard ducks and I saw Canada geese and I saw killdeer and some sparrows. So I'm going to start through here. They have the geese, uh, um, the birds listed by the type of bird, and it starts off with waterfowl. So I'm going to put in Canada geese. There's a big number of Canada geese. And then uh, I'm going to saw put in the mallard ducks. Then it was how do you make sure how do you decide on how many birds to put in? Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, that is uh, again, that's a skill that is learned. Uh, I try to estimate uh, when I can see and uh, the birds and see they're not moving and uh, count them and try to get as uh, as close of a count as I can. Uh, I count them in the list. Uh, that's what uh, yes, that's what if you can see right here where my cursor is uh, submitting complete lists versus incomplete lists. So say if I'm out birding and I see a big group of geese fly by uh, that are too fast for me to count, I wouldn't include those on my birding list. However, if I saw um, the flock of geese land at the pond and then I was able to account, oh, account there were uh, two dozen geese, 24 geese, uh, and I saw them and double checked myself that is how I would decide how many birds to count. Yes. 
Then there was this bird, the killdeer, which is a type of plover. And uh, yes, we're going on and on. I only have a, a few more birds to count. Uh, So Parker is scrolling down, but you can also in the top uh, right hand corner. Oh, yes, thank you. Up to specific species if you have a hard time finding them, and then it'll bring you exactly to the spot that you're looking for. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, yes, I saw a morning dove out there, and I saw a spotted towhee, which is a type of uh, sparrow. And uh, I also saw. Um, for song sparrows. And uh, I saw a lesser goldfinch. What happens if you see a bird on your list that's not on the eBird list, Barker? Ah, uh, yes. The eBird, the seeing a bird that's not on the eBird list, what you would do uh, was you would click the add species button or you check this box that says show rarities, uh, yes, you would do that. Uh, I will have, a, a, during my trips at, tips and tricks and troubleshooting section of the presentation, I will um, go into that and how you can deal with the, uh, um, uh, if you see like say a rare bird species, which is not listed, or if you see a very large number of birds. So for this uh, summarized example, I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight uh, different bird species. So I'm going to go here and I check the box that said uh, complete checklist and I'm gonna double check my, I'm gonna click submit. And the great thing about eBird is it lets me double check. So right here and Presto, eight species observed, uh, 69 different individuals at Rancho San Rafael Park. And uh, as you can see, pretty much uh, it's as simple as uh, one, two, three, just uh, inputting things, just like say making a post on Facebook or Instagram or other social media. So now let me get back uh, um, from uh, this current slide here to my presentation. Alrighty, so now we're gonna go into the tips and tricks uh, about using eBird. So the first question you might have asked me about are private locations. Let's say you want to eBird from your home, but you don't feel comfortable about sharing your home address uh, with the world, or say you're out birding and you find a bird's nest, which you don't feel comfortable about revealing to the world because you don't want the nest and the chicks to be harmed. eBird does have the option for posting personal locations, which are private, meaning they're only shared, they're only uh, uh, shared with you and they're shared on your life list. They're not shared on uh, a. Uh, they're not shared on the global bird on the eBird community. Other people can't see it, so you can protect your privacy and protect sensitive bird species. So now the next question you're probably asking about is photography. Do can you do uh, photography uh, um, when you're using eBird or uh, is photography a prerequisite uh, for using eBird? And the answer is yes, you can do uh, photography and it is encouraged uh, on eBird, uh, but it is not a prerequisite. Uh, with me, uh, I, uh, I'm more about listing. So uh, I'm usually out there with uh, my uh, um, pen and paper and binoculars, uh, I can't really add a camera to that uh, mix. Uh, although uh, other people are, uh, um, this person was on our walk when she took this picture of a white-faced ibis. And I know Ben uh, is an excellent photographer as well and routinely adds photos uh, on his eBird walks to eBird. They all go into their database, which is the Macaulay Library. 
So well, the next I, can, one, I, can I add one thing before we move yeah. on from the Macaulay Library? So yes. uh, the Macaulay Library is slightly separate from eBird, but it can be used by all sorts of folks. And so if you're a photographer and you just like taking portraits of birds in different locations, that's fantastic. But if uh, you're taking specific uh, be, uh, photos of specific behaviors even, so say like this white-faced ibis foraging, you can tag those specific behaviors on your photograph and allow people to specifically search for those behaviors within the giant library of photos that makes a Macaulay library. And researchers actually use these. So for example, um, uh, there's a paper that I know of that is actually trying to nail down differences in hummingbird molt. And one of the ways that they did that, because there was a variety of different guides out there available in the world, but there was all sorts of differences in where people debated on whether or not Anna's hummingbirds molted for one or two or whatever months. And uh, if you take pictures of hummingbirds and notice that they're molting, you can add them to Macaulay Library and that'll put the time stamp on that photograph. And you can say that that bird was molting and sometimes you can actually see that in the photograph as well. And that's what this researcher used uh, to find out that in fact, um, uh, some of the birds molted for much longer than what was previously thought. And so this can be really valuable contributions to not only, you know, your own personal collection of photographs, but just the general scientific knowledge about a species. So I really like taking lots of photos and I like to contribute to photos um, uh, and, and, you know, to the Macaulay Library. It's absolutely, like Parker said, not required. Um, uh, but just know that if you do like to contribute, they are trademarked for your, your own photograph. So people can't just use them willy nilly. They have to ask for your permission, um, but they can be really valuable in um, uh, furthering our understanding of the birds around us. So I just always encourage it. So, okay, back to you, Parker. Definitely great points, Ben. So now we're gonna get into what Ben was mentioning, which is about rare sightings. Uh, this is an, ex an example, say you're out uh, bird watching the finches in your bird feeder and you see this bald eagle fly by your house. Uh, that bald eagle could count on your life list. Uh, however, say if you go into eBird uh, and you saw that the bald eagle was not listed in your area at that time of year, you would definitely want to uh, um, put uh, show rarities and you, would, uh, you could put that bald eagle in. However, what eBird likes is it would like to have some evidence uh, of that uh, eagle. So uh, at best, uh, what the eBird really likes is what are called field notes. Uh, these can be either photographs or uh, if say like say with this bald eagle say it was just a whiz flyby um, and uh, you didn't uh, you couldn't have time to even you barely had time to see it, let alone get your camera or phone and take a photo of it. Uh, you could include that eBird sighting, but you would want to include uh, eBird lets you write notes uh, field notes to your checklist and you would write in your uh, checklist, uh, observed a bald eagle in a quick flyby. Uh, uh, yeah, you write something like that to let them know what had happened. Um, it really does help though, uh, if you can get uh, photos uh, um, to add to your field notes, it really does help if you have that photos uh, and uh, it helps the compilers who, uh, the volunteer compilers who run eBirds to have this evidence. This is a species, a greater white fronted goose, which uh, at a rare event uh, appeared at Sparks Marina. And uh, um, I heard about this and even I was skeptical about greater white fronted goose uh, being at the marina. They'd only been seen like once or twice before. So I went out there uh, with my friends and we, con con we confirmed that they were greater white fronted geese and I had my camera and took this photo, submitted it to eBird and eBird accepted it. So now uh, I'm gonna get on to some other resources. Uh, I have just, you know, gone over eBird and basically I'm giving you, you know, the thumbnail sketch of eBird and what eBird can do. There are plenty of other resources out there. Uh, 
I highly recommend visiting the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. They are the people that manage both. They manage eBird, they manage the Macaulay Library, what Ben was talking about, and they also manage uh, the website allaboutbirds.org. They have a, a whole bunch of free educational courses about like how to use eBird and classes you can take online as well as they offer, you know, uh, advanced classes uh, for premium purchase. They also have a YouTube channel that is full of videos, both educational videos about like how to create a checklist, how to uh, bird watch or uh, bird photography, or even just fun things like uh, people out in South America doing birding research. Uh, so definitely uh, Google Cornell Lab of Ornithology or uh, search that on YouTube to find their channel. I will be following up uh, with a, uh, um, a PDF of this, which will have links to all these sites. And uh, I also wanted to talk about our program of uh, Birding by Bus. Uh, this is a program I created. It is on our website. And uh, I uh, was inspired by eBird and used eBird to create Birding by Bus, which is an interactive Google map of birding hotspots within the Reno Sparks metro area. All of these, this map right here, all of these hummingbird icons are actually a birding hotspot. You can click on it. Uh, it'll tell you all about what the hotspot is. It gives you a link to the eBird site, which uh, tells you about all the species that are there this time of year. It is also compatible with uh, mobile devices such as phones, so you can use your map apps and it will take you right to these parks. Or if you don't have access to a car, almost most all of these parks are accessible from a bus stop. So you can go on there, it'll tell you which bus route to take and which bus stop to take. Uh, it's on our website. If you just Google Nevada Audubon.org uh, and then click on the uh, birding by bus icon, it'll take you there and you can go out and have some fun birding within your community. And now basically uh, I'll stop screen sharing. Now it can be time for questions. So Parker, actually, do you mind sharing another screen as we talk? Can you go on to eBird and go on to the Explore Data page? Uh, yes. We can share the, the page that shows each checklist being uploaded from across the world. Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, yes, I believe. Awesome. So uh, Susie Reynolds asked a question, and she asked, how do we make a private entry? Ah, yes. In order to make a private entry, uh, what you would do would be you would submit, uh, when you'd be submitting a checklist, uh, you would be uh, um, uh, use this one, uh, um, use latitude and longitude earth. You'd use uh, the uh, um, find it on a map. Uh, let's say we can put in Nevada. You just go down to the map right here and uh, say, let's scroll on in. And yes, if you see right here on the map, uh, actually right now, there are these little blue uh, marks. These blue marks are personal locations. You just click on uh, the map. Uh, once you find some place you're birding at, like say you live right here, You'd click on this and then uh, you would click, uh, I need to move this. Uh, you you'd click here and you'd click on them. Uh, it's, excuse me, I'm having some technical difficulties. But yeah, you can click on the map right here. And then it says uh, enter location name and you type it in. Uh, and then you'd click continue and uh, at first, these all your uh, locations you enter are uh, all going to be personal locations that will not be uh, publicly known unless, say, you share them with another eBird user. 
Um, you can suggest yeah, um, it as a burning hot spot, but that makes it public. And uh, it takes some time to get a hot spot uh, um, uh, or a location uh, set aside as a burning hot spot. It helps to go out there with multiple eBird users and have them all share it with everybody and have multiple people suggest it as a hot spot. And then the compiler will make it as a hot spot. And, and I will just add to that too. So Susie, if, uh, if you're really interested in actually hiding a lot of your observations, you can do that as well. So you can hide the entire checklist and that's if you're editing. So after you've submitted a checklist, there's actually a large blue box with like a little pen and a square box in the right corner of the screen. And you can click on that box and it'll give you a drop down menu and you can say that you wanna hide that list from eBird output. Um, however, if you do that, so that, that means that it just, it won't show up anywhere uh, within the eBird database. It will just be your own private observation and it will be associated with you and you'll be able to see that observation, but no one else will. And it will be excluded from use, the data will be excluded from any sort of analysis that um, uh, the, that the eBird, the folks that manage the eBird database uh, use. So for example, right, all of these contributions can be used to map migration routes of different species, uh, local abundances of different species, and so your observations would be excluded from any of that data use. And so that's the only downside to making some of your observations private is that it doesn't communicate or doesn't integrate into the larger community science goals of eBird, but you absolutely can do that. Definitely, definitely. Uh, and then Alan Gubonic, and I already typed an answer, but Alan asked, how do you submit a photo to eBird? And I know we just talked about photos too, but you can also upload sounds. And so I try to record a bunch of birds too. Um, uh, and it's actually hanging on my wall. I'm a huge nerd. So I'll just, I'll show you guys. Um, uh, you, can, you can record with all kinds of stuff. I actually have a small parabolic microphone that I record a lot of birds with. Um, uh, but you can record birds, all sorts of vocalizations as well, and upload those to eBird, uh, not just photographs. Um, uh, but anyway, I'll turn that over to you, Parker. Do you want to show how to upload a photo? Yes, yes. Uh, or actually, I'll go uh, right here to uh, my eBird, and uh, I will look at this one. Uh, basically, uh, what you can do right here is if you see this button that says, I'll click on it, Add Media on your list and then we can go through and uh, yes, uh, you'd be on your computer and say uh, um, you'd uh, find, uh, say if you already had your, uh, you'd upload the photos uh, from your camera or smartphone camera to your computer and then uh, you can uh, drag and drop them uh, here, uh, say on the species you want, like let's say a mallard, you could drag and drop them on the mallard and then uh, you could put in details, like you could put in notes, uh, as well as, you know, uh, um, they have other checklists uh, that I can show as well. In fact, uh, why don't I do that right now? Uh, um, why don't we can come back to this right now? Uh, I'll show you an example of that uh, with a photo I took. But uh, yeah, why don't we talk about first, uh, um, uh, yes, uh, you were talking about the uh, data maps. Yes, I believe it's here, Ben. Uh, you're muted, Ben. Uh, myself. Yeah, so actually go to the Explore option. Click on Explore. Again, go to that main tab and scroll all the way to the bottom. Uh, and it says Submission Map. That's what I was talking about. So just to give uh, you an uh, idea yes. of like the global contributions of eBird and the community that you're contributing to, this is a map and it flashes at different data locations as uh, eBird checklists are logged um, uh, all across the world. So. Um, uh, we might not be seeing, it's really fun to watch, like kind of, there's one on the eastern side of North America, there's one up in Minnesota, one in Washington, um, uh, as there's by you, so it's kind of fun to watch, uh, so you can see uh, across the globe. Uh, and are you ready for the next question, Parker? Uh, yes, yes, okay. I'm ready for the next so question. Susie has a tricky one, which, and I'm, unfortunately, I'm not familiar 
with the softwares that she's mentioning, but she's asking if you can import a life list made by other software like BirdBrain or Scytheville into eBird and keep your list private. Um, I know, I definitely imagine you can import a life list. Uh, I've not uh, ever done that myself, but I know that uh, eBird life lists can be, uh, um, they can be exported uh, as say like a PDF or an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, they can definitely be done that way. Uh, yes, uh, you can export it from eBird, say like to your own personal computer. Uh, I do not, uh, I have not heard of people doing that, but I imagine it could be done, definitely. Uh, as far as uh, confidentiality with se uh, se sensitive species or private locations, I'm not sure about that as well. But eBird does definitely have a, a help tab uh, there. And um, yeah, and for some sensitive species, especially for owl species and some falcon species, they're automatically hid from output um, uh, from eBird. And so uh, there's, if you're really worried about sensitive species, like for example, in the local region, like of a spotted owl, even if you upload those as a historical uh, log, they will be hidden from eBird output. So people can't see those. And I just, I added a typed answer to your question too, Susie, because I, I believe that if you can export like a CSV file or an Excel file from BirdBrain or Scytheville, you should be able to upload it into eBird as that large document, but you would upload it as a historical observation. And then if you would like to make those private, you absolutely can, you just hide hide those from eBird output. I think, you know, historical, you're able to make all sorts of historical observations. I don't think anybody have, is alive now, but like, I think you can upload like, for example, the dodo as a historical observation, even though it's an extinct species, but it, you can log it in eBird. Just don't do it now. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, uh, but or, you can uh, up upload that as a historical observation. Yes, or the passenger pigeon, or uh, as many birders would, dream and covet an ivory billed woodpecker. Um, as uh, I mentioned uh, for Susie's question right now, uh, here uh, is uh, this, uh, this is the eBird Help Center. So whenever you're an eBird, uh, even at the homepage, uh, if you just scroll down to the bottom uh, right here, uh, yes, here is the Macaulay Library that Ben was talking about with both photos and uh, um, videos and audio. Uh, if you go down here to the bottom and click contact, uh, yeah, and again, you just type your email address in. They have uh, questions about uh, um, eBird, uh, Merlin, and yes, the uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology also manages the bird ID at Merlin. And then uh, the Macaulay Library and eBird, uh, Macaulay Library and Media Requests. And then you just type in uh, the subject and your description. And uh, um, you can attach a file, say, like uh, if you wanted your spreadsheet or needed help identifying a photo. And uh, yeah, you just uh, do the uh, check this box if you attached a screenshot and uh, fill out this uh, recaptcha um, test, and then you'd be good to go. Uh, um, eBird has been uh, pretty punctual. I mean, considering how they're such a big organization and uh, I'm sure they're receiving so much contact from people all over the world, they generally respond within say uh, three, uh, three to five business days. Uh, so decent amount of time, yes. And I'll say too that there's plenty of resources. It's an eBird community discussion group on Facebook. And so if you want a bunch of fast responses by people that might partially know the answer, there's a lot of eBird, not necessarily people that are actually working with the software, but some reviewers or other people that just use eBird really frequently, they could answer um, a question relatively quickly as well. So that's a, if you guys have Facebook or are just willing to look on online forums, that's another great resource that I use. Um, uh, as well. Yep, yep. 
Well, that's the end of my presentation. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, any others you've seen from the chat, Ben, or uh, from Facebook? No, no, on, nothing on Facebook and uh, no more in the uh, Q&A session right now. Um, uh, so not currently. Okay. Well, uh, I guess that's it for today. Uh, but uh, once again, everybody, thank you so, so much for joining us on this webinar. Uh, this webinar, as I said, will be recorded and uploaded to our Facebook page and YouTube channel so you can review it uh, as many times as you wish. Uh, as I said before, this is part of our big day celebration. Uh, we encourage everybody on Saturday for big day to uh, go out and appreciate the birds you see. These can be say going out birding yourself or joining walks such as uh, the walks that Ben and I are respectively hosting on big day. Uh, I also wanted to mention uh, um, with anybody, uh, if you go out and have eBird uh, and get an account, please share our, uh, your checklists with us. Uh, we would love to have them uh, as part of our uh, Lahontan Audubon account. It is part of the reason why it exists to connect with our local birding community. Like I said before, it's big day. Uh, however you choose to spend it, I hope you have a wonderful time. Thank you so much, Ben, and take it easy, everyone.